Uh, well, good, good evening, everybody. Hello. It's nice and warm in here compared to outside. <laughs> so um, my name is Patrick Spiro. I'm the executive director of the George Washington Presidential Library, and it's great to see so many people here tonight. Uh, I'm thrilled to welcome a friend, Ed Gray, to talk about what I think is a fascinating book. Um, but before that, just wanted to make a few uh, announcements. Um, first off, uh, this is uh, the second to last Ford Evening Book Talk of the year for us. And this is really significant because the partnership with Ford Motor Company goes back to the year 1923. So this is the 100th anniversary of a partnership with Ford Motor Company. Uh, and this is the second, last, uh, second to last one for this year. So it's really uh, a remarkable uh, partnership. And I want to thank Ford uh, for their support. Yeah. <laughs> which means you really should come to the last one, which is in December. December the 12th, we're hosting uh, Sandy Winnefeld, uh, who had a distinguished career in the military, in the Navy, and now in the private sector. And he's written a book on leadership titled Sailing Upwind, Leadership and Risk from Top Gun, because he was a Top Gun pilot, to the Situation Room. Um, so that's December the 12th. Uh, uh, and that will be, will that be here, Stephen? Oh, be at the library on the 12th. Uh, the other thing I want to announce, uh, we're now doing lunchtime programming, and December the 18th, we have our final brown bag uh, for the year. So on December 18th, come during the noon hour, bring your own lunch, and hear a fascinating talk on the John Mitchell map. Uh, this is one of the most important maps in early American history. It uh, captured the British Empire's thinking in 1755 and really helped inform the coming of the American Revolution. And to host that talk is Alexandra Montgomery, uh, who's a historian, is also manager of our Center for Digital History. And she's organizing a digital project hosted here at Mount Vernon called Argo, American Revolutionary Geographies Online. And what she and a team of others are doing are digitizing every map that relates to the American Revolution that we can find in repositories around the globe and creating a unified repository. Uh, so Alexandra's gonna be talking about one of these maps called the Mitchell map on December the 18th for a brown bag lunch. And I can also say Alexandra, we should all give her a round of applause because she's working behind that uh, wall there making sure we're streaming live online. And welcome to all of our online uh, attendees. We usually get 50 to 60 people online. So uh, thank you all for uh, streaming in tonight. So now, uh, for the reason we're all here, it's my honor to introduce Ed Gray, uh, someone who I've known as a friend and a colleague for years, who has talked to me about this project uh, for as long as I've known him, uh, who published uh, an early essay on this topic in an anthology that I co-edited with uh, a colleague of mine. Um, Ed is a distinguished uh, historian of early America. He's been a professor at Florida State University since 1999. He has been prolific in uh, both the amount of, that he's published, but how interesting it is. He always provides a much needed and different, uh, almost oblique perspective on the past. And you maybe have, remember him for his last book, Tom Paine's Bridge, which he gave a talk to here and I got to see. That was published in 2016. He almost all also published a book on John Ledyard, uh, who was probably one of the most fascinating explorers in early America, uh, and that was uh, titled The Making of John Ledyard, Empire and Ambition in the Life of an Early American Traveler. He traveled as far as Siberia. Uh, also published New World Babel, Language and Nations in Early America, and is the co-editor of the Oxford Handbook of the American Revolution. And this is Ed's first book talk for his new book on the Mason and Dixon line. So we are here to hear his initial book talk. So thank you, Ed, for coming. Ed is going to sign books afterwards. And if you have questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, Stephen McLeod is going to be walking around with a mic. Um, he will bring the mic to you. you don't have, we won't call on you. He will bring the mic to you. So try and grab Stephen's eye uh, for questions. Ed? Well, um, thank you, Patrick, for that wonderful introduction. And, uh, and thank you all for coming. I know it's cold. Um, it's, it's very cold for me. Uh, 
Um, although I'm, I'm a born and bred Chicagoan, but 25 years in Florida has, it, it, it does affect one's physiology, yeah. Um, um, it's really thrilling to be back here. Um, I, I'm very much uh, indebted to, to Patrick and to Stephen for uh, inviting me to do this and, and organizing it, and of course Ford for, for underwriting this uh, series of talks. Um, uh, you know, I can't give any kind of talk without um, uh, talking, uh, saying something about the state of the humanities and, and uh, um, support for the humanities, and, uh, um, and, and this is a real uh, unique and special uh, thing that, that Mount Vernon does. Um, um, so you know, it's, it's really a, a privilege to be here and, and to be able to talk to you. Um, so I'm going to talk for probably 40 minutes, which means it will be probably more like 45 minutes. Um, and it, uh, I, this is the first time I've given this talk, but I expect to give it quite a few times. Um, and I hope uh, you think that it's worthy of, of, of uh, that. Um, um, so this is my new book, and, and I, I'll just uh, introduce the subject of it. I'm going to obviously talk about that subject um, by saying that the, the phrase, the, the main title here is probably familiar to you, certainly be familiar to anybody who took uh, US history in high school, 19th century US history. Um, it's something you've certainly heard of if you uh, have read a book about the Civil War era of the United States. Um, and you, you no doubt think about it if you have some awareness of Mason-Dixon uh, in terms of the, the uh, more familiar uh, phrase, the Mason-Dixon line, or the equally familiar phrase, the Mason-Dixon line. Um, um, you know, the, the term has become so ubiquitous and kind of common in American culture that it's been uh, appropriated for, for branding purposes, uh, especially by, by firms that are interested in, in highlighting their, their southern orientation. Um, the one uh, of this group that I have a special affection for is, is the one in the lower right, uh, the, um, um, uh, the uh, uh, Dixie Bell Paint Company's furniture paint, Mason Dixon Gray, because if you happen to Google Mason Dixon Gray, Mason Dixon, my book, Gray, my name, you're going to see that paint. So, um, so I've become very familiar with this uh, product. Uh, <laughs> um, so uh, the subject of my book is, I think, at some level, uh, both more than what you think of when you think of the Mason-Dixon line um, and less. Um, and I want to try to, uh, uh, this, is, this is my conceit for this talk, that, that in a way I'm, I'm, I'm talking about something that is less than what you typically think of when you think of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, but I think in framing uh, the subject in the way that the book does, um, it affords a broader uh, historical perspective on something that you know is uh, is uh, understood to be fairly familiar to to most students of American history. Um, so, to begin to give you some sense of this, I'm gonna uh, let's see here. Um, I'm gonna show you some slides from some. So, first of all, this is I, I introduced this map just as a way of. Of, of reminding us of what people tend to think about when they think of the Mason-Dixon line. Uh, they think of a sectional divide, uh, a United States divided north and south, um, divided between the sections that are pro-slavery and the sections that become anti-slavery during the Civil War year, era, um, a, a country that is profoundly divided politically um, um, and divided along a very stark a geographic uh, fulcrum or, 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 or point, as, as suggested by this map. Um, and so when I say that my book uh, is, 
in a certain sense, less than what is uh, uh, typically uh, thought about when we, when we think about the Mason-Dixon line, at least if we think about it in terms of this national uh, north-south divide. Um, what I mean is that the geographic scope of, of the book is much more circumscribed um, than what is commonly thought of when we think about the, the, the divide between um, north and south. Um, and so I want to try to talk a little bit about why I made that decision um, and what makes the area in this uh, small rectangle here, turns out it's not that small, but because the United States is gigantic, it looks small on this map, um, why I made the decision to focus uh, on this region. Um, and what I'd like to do to begin here is share with you uh, some slides um, from some trips that my wife and I took last fall um, in the region uh, uh, demarcated by this um, rectangle. It's an area that is, I'm sure, very familiar to people in this room, perhaps more familiar uh, in this form. Um, 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 uh, obviously a modern uh, interstate highway map, a little detail from it. But it's the detail that roughly equates to the, uh, the, the, the portion of the prior map that I showed you. Um, and we visited some sites uh, and, and took some interesting slides, and I'm going to talk about those. And they're denoted on this map by the red circles. Um, so I'm going to let me uh, talk a little bit about our travels and, and some of the slides we took. Um, and I'm going to start with this slide. There we go. Um, so what you see here is a small uh, limestone monument. It's about three feet high and one feet square. Um, and it lies at the center of a tiny unincorporated town uh, called Marydell, which is in Maryland, although it's located precisely on the state line uh, along Halltown Road. I'm sure some of you know this area. Um, uh, it's uh, Halltown Road is Maryland 454, which becomes Delaware Route 8. And this stone is situated uh, uh, innocuously uh, between a firehouse parking lot and a private, uh, uh, someone's lawn, a private residence. Um, and you can see two of the slides we took. So the top slide uh, shows the Delaware side of the monument. Um, and on the Delaware side of the monument is the family crest of the Penns, the descendants of William Penn, uh, who established the colony of Pennsylvania in 1681. Uh, the Maryland side shows the Calvert family crest, the Calvert's descendants, of course, of the first and second Lords Baltimore, uh, George and Cecil Calvert, the founders of Maryland in the early 1630s. So at the time the stone was originally set, and it wasn't originally placed in the current location, it was moved around quite a bit, um, particularly in the 19th century, but the stone was probably set um, in the late fall of 1764. And at that time, uh, the Penns still owned Pennsylvania, and the Calverts still owned Maryland. Uh, the Penns also uh, controlled Delaware, which uh, they had done since William Penn founded uh, Pennsylvania in the uh, 1680s, and hence the Penn family crest on the Delaware side of this uh, stone. Um, so the marker is made of English limestone, and it was imported into the British American colonies in uh, uh, the fall of uh, the prior fall, 1763, uh, by two Englishmen, uh, 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 Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon. Um, so Mason and Dixon had been hired by Frederick Calvert, the sixth Lord Baltimore, uh, and the proprietor of Maryland, and by Richard and Thomas Penn, uh, sons of the late William Penn, and at the time the proprietors of, of Pennsylvania, although Thomas, the older of the two Penn brothers, was the, uh, the, the, the chief proprietor. So these colonial uh, uh, um, landowners, or, or colony owners, is really what they were. Um, they're living in London uh, in the period that, that I'm talking about here. Um, they hired Mason and Dixon to uh, uh, bring an end to a decades-old, 
property dispute between their two families, uh, a dispute over the respected, uh, respective boundaries of their families' American estates. After a series of failed attempts undertaken by colonial surveyors, the Pens and the Calverts turned to Britain's leading astronomers and mathematicians, uh, many of whom were associated with the Royal Observatory at Greenwich in England, um, and they consulted the director of the Royal Observatory, the Astronomer Royal at the time, um, uh, a man by the name of Nathaniel Bliss. Um, and Bliss suggested that, the, uh, that Lord Baltimore and the Pens employ uh, Mason and Dixon, uh, two of his associates who had recently returned to England from uh, an astronomical expedition to collect observations of the transit of Venus across the face of the sun which is a vital uh, 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 thing to observe and measure for determining uh, 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 inter-celestial uh, distances within the solar system. Um, and uh, Mason Dixon had been conducting this work at the Cape of Good Hope, so they had a good deal of experience with distant travelers and, and doing astronomical observations in environments that were entirely uh, congenial. Um, okay, so let me now show you a couple more slides. Um, so this is, uh, um, uh, you can see on the, the top of the, the three slides here is a, uh, a plaque. And the plaque is located um, in Chester County, Pennsylvania, just off of Embryville Road, which is Pennsylvania 162. Um, it's actually on a small lane that, that runs off of Embryville Road called Stargazers Road. Um, and if you turn on to Stargazers Road from Embryville Road, which my wife and I did last fall, um, the plaque is situated just off the road on the right. And the plaque says the following. A few feet back of this sign is the Stargazers Stone, marked by the Chester County Historical Society, 1909. So of course, uh, as I say, my wife and I went and visited this, uh, this site. Uh, we pulled off to the side of the road, read the plaque, and then walked uh, to the uh, aforementioned um, Stargazer Stone. And if you walk uh, behind the plaque, there's an unused uh, or an abandoned farm field, now just a nice lawn. And you can see in the middle slide there, uh, a nice stone enclosure, which was created by the Chester County Historical Society. And then if you peer over the edge, you see there that stunning and extraordinary historical <laughs> artifact, a, 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 a piece of granite. Um, and the granite is, uh, is uh, assumed to be uh, a stone that was set by Mason and Dixon um, to serve as the benchmark, that is the point whose coordinates uh, were, were the starting point for all of the rest of their surveying activities in uh, British North America. Okay, more family slides, but this one features me. Um, and this is the third and this is the final uh, travel slide that I'll show you. Um, um, and the final uh, historical site for me to highlight. Um, so what you see here, I'm standing next to this uh, small monument. Uh, the monument is located on the Pennsylvania-West Virginia state line. It's about two and a half miles west of I-79 and about 14 miles uh, northwest of Morgantown, West Virginia. And the monument is on a hilltop above the meandering Dunkard Creek, and it was placed there in 1893. It marks the farthest western point of the Mason-Dixon survey, of the Mason-Dixon boundary survey. It's about uh, 230 miles from uh, the farthest eastern point of the survey, with some qualification, which I'll explain in a second, but Basically, the, the, the western section of their survey um, is roughly the distance of, say, D.C. to, to New York. It's about uh, 230 miles, so it's, a, it's quite a, an extraordinarily long uh, um, um, uh, 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 line to, to, to establish. Um, and I think, uh, yeah, so um, the surveyors and their party reached this point on October 9th, 1767, this is about four years uh, after they began their American survey. Okay, so that's uh, all for the uh, family travel slides. Um, let me now move on to 
uh, a less uh, uh, esoteric uh, uh, image. Um, um, this is a, a, a map, a slide, depicting the Mason-Dixon survey. Um, um, and you can see that uh, the sites that my wife and I visited are all within the area uh, depicted um, in this map. And it's within this region, or the area that is depicted by this map, uh, this is what constitutes the subject of my book. So when I talk about the Mason-Dixon, Mason meaning the Mason-Dixon line, this is what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the original uh, Mason-Dixon survey. And you can see here, um, this is the, the pointer. Um, this is the end point. Uh, this is the tangent line. So they surveyed this line. This is the line separating. this line because um, the charter that William Penn received for his colony uh, uh, stipulated that the western limit of the colony uh, would lie five degrees of longitude um, uh, due west of the point at which, I'm sorry, this is a little tedious, the, the southern boundary intersects with the Delaware River. So in order to know that, uh, that measurement, the terrestrial distance between points of longitude, at this latitude, they had to know where the, this line would have intersected with the Delaware. So that's what the east line is, and this is the point where they stopped. Um, so, uh, so I think one of the things we can take away from this brief survey of the, uh, or brief summary of the, the Mason-Dixon survey, um, is that, uh, well, two things. One is that, that the scope of my, my subject here is, is much smaller than what I think we commonly think of when we think of the Mason-Dixon line. I'm not talking about the entire United States. Um, um, I think another thing to be said here is uh, um, um, the line itself was not undertaken, uh, or when it was undertaken, when it was created by Mason-Dixon, um, it had nothing to do with the usual associations uh, that we have with the Mason-Dixon line, um, uh, slavery and sectionalism. Um, so uh, when we think about slavery, um, um, uh, when we think about those things in the context of the Mason-Dixon line, uh, the country is divided. At the time Mason-Dixon conducted their survey, uh, there was no divide between slave states or slave colonies and free colonies. All of the British American colonies tolerated slavery. Um, all of them uh, not, didn't just tolerate it, but, but it was uh, uh, integral to, the, to their labor systems. Um, so there's nothing about this line uh, that, uh, that marked um, a division between slave states and free states. Um, so that's, when, when I talk about the less, this is what I mean. I'm talking about the, 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 the line that Mason-Dixon uh, uh, initially surveyed. Uh, let me now talk about the more, or at least let me start to, to move towards the more. Um, so I think um, in, in focusing on the original line, on this original uh, boundary that, that these uh, Englishmen surveyed, um, my book shows that the forces commonly associated with the Mason-Dixon line have a much deeper history than we commonly uh, recognize. And it turns out that although the line doesn't separate slave states from free states, slavery is very much part of the line's history uh, from the very beginning. Sectionalism, that is the profound political divide that centers on the issue of slavery, isn't really a part of the line's history till much later, and I'll, I'll talk about that. But it very much does impinge on the history of the original Mason-Dixon line. Um, so I want to spend part of the talk uh, explaining what I mean by all this and how slavery does impinge on the early history of the line. Um, but before I do that, let me try to uh, explain to you exactly why this line needed to be surveyed in the first place. Um, to give you some sense of the nature of the dispute that Mason and Dixon had been hired to try to resolve. 
Um, and since fundamentally that dispute was a dispute over the control of land, I think the best way for me to, to begin to illustrate that um, is, is once again to show you some maps. So I'm going to show you a few maps here. Um, so this is a map that shows the boundaries of the colony of Maryland, uh, named, of course, for uh, Henrietta Maria, uh, the queen consort of uh, King Charles I of England. Um, these boundaries were stipulated by the king's agents, uh, uh, members of, of the king's privy council and the attorneys who advised them um, in the document that, uh, that established the existence of this uh, this uh, this uh, proprietary colony, the document that served as the means of conveying to a uh, uh, to Lord Baltimore a portion of the royal realm, um, and that document, that charter, uh, um, uh, had a number of stipulations about the border or the boundary or the limits, the geo geographic limits of Maryland. And Maryland was actually unique; it was the first colony to have uh, sharp lineal uh, boundaries um, uh, created by, uh, by England. And I should also say that the map uh, is entirely conjectural in the sense that um, it, it's, it's a modern rendering of the terms as, as uh, stated in the document establishing the colony. Um, the, the, the cartographic knowledge at the time this was done or the maps that would have been available to the uh, lawyers and privy councillors who, who produced the, the charter describing the property that was being given to or, or granted to, uh, uh, to the Calverts, um, there was nothing remotely equivalent to this uh, at that time. Um, for our purposes, there, so there's a number of things about this map that are, that are interesting, but, but for the purposes of, of discussing Mason and Dixon's survey, the, the, the feature here that is most significant is the dotted line at the top of the map. Um, and that dotted line is uh, coterminous with the 40th parallel of north latitude, of latitude north. Um, and that, uh, that the, the charter issued to, uh, uh, actually was issued to the second Lord Baltimore, Cecil Calvert, stipulated that the family estate, the American uh, grant given to the Calvert family, would end at this 40th parallel of latitude. Okay, so that's the first map. Let me now show you another map. Um, so this is a map uh, that was produced in 1681, uh, probably commissioned by William Penn himself, um, and intended to accompany promotional materials that Penn assembled uh, just as his colony, uh, Pennsylvania, received its royal charter sanctioning the existence of this private domain in New World lands. Um, Penn immediately and very uh, uh, um, prodigiously set about recruiting settlers to come to Pennsylvania, and he used maps uh, as, as, as part of the uh, you know, um, recruiting uh, uh, propaganda that he generated. Um, and there are a couple of details on this map that I want to draw your attention to, actually two details. Uh, the first is down here in the lower corner. Um, and what you can see here is, or what you can see, but this is uh, right here the little symbol that, that symbolizes um, uh, the small English settlement of uh, Newcastle. Um, okay. Would that be better for you? Um, yeah, so there's a little symbol here. Little symbol, little symbol here that symbolizes the small English settlement of Newcastle. Um, and then uh, up here, this is the, the Schuylkill River. So I'll show you these details uh, up close. Um, so when you look at this uh, uh, more closely, there, there are two things. So here's the, here's the Newcastle. Uh, settlement. Um, and then when you get down here in the corner, there's a number, and the number is 40. So this is through the center of the Delaware Bay, roughly at the latitude of, of Baltimore. Um, and then if you go to the top of the map in the center, uh, there's another number, 
uh, near the mouth of the Rancocas Creek that dumps into the uh, Delaware River um, up north of present-day Philadelphia, and it says 41. <laughs> um, and here's the uh, Schuylkill, um, and, and this is what is depicted on this map as the 41st parallel of latitude. So you can probably see where I'm going with this, but there's a bit of a discrepancy. Um, uh, uh, um, so, yeah, Penn understands his, uh, the, the southern boundary of his colony to lie about 50 miles south um, of uh, 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 the location uh, that is stipulated um, um, uh, in, in uh, um, the charter for, uh, for the colony of Maryland. Um, and of course, the actual 40th parallel of latitude uh, lies well north of uh, Newcastle in Delaware. Um, it roughly crosses, it's north of Philadelphia or north Philadelphia, roughly around where Germantown is, if you're familiar with Philadelphia. So there's a, a real sharp discrepancy here um, uh, um, in, in the understanding of their uh, mutual uh, boundaries. Now, this gives rise to a lot of litigation, um, and that litigation goes on for quite some time, even before Mason and Dixon arrive in the colonies. Um, but ultimately, they have come to, 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 to bring an end once and for all to the dispute that arose because of the discrepancies in the founding uh, charters of the colonies of Maryland and, and Pennsylvania. So the problem uh, has very deep roots um, in, in the colonial era. Um, so let me now turn to an issue that I mentioned before, which is slavery and, and, and the line. And I said that uh, um, Mason and Dixon's survey uh, and, and the line that they created was not a demarcation between uh, areas that sanctioned slavery and areas that did not. Um, but it turns out that slavery uh, uh, had a role in uh, the early history of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, it even has a role in the work that Mason and Dixon themselves do. Um, so let me try to give you some sense of what I mean by this, uh, and I'll draw your attention now to another map. So what you see here is what is known as a strip map, um, and it shows Mason and Dixon's entire survey uh, the map was produced by the Philadelphia engraver James Smither and the printer Robert Kennedy, um, and it was produced after an original um, manuscript map uh, in the same form, in the same format, prepared uh, by Mason and Dixon um, in the spring of 1768 after they had completed their, uh, their surveying activities. Um, you can't tell from this uh, image, but the map is, is very large. It's about six feet long and two feet uh, in, in width. Um, in order to produce the printed version of the map, uh, the printers um, uh, did this. So they had two large sheets um, and they cut, uh, they, 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 they split the parts of the map up, uh, as you can see here. Um, what, what I showed you first is a, is a cut and pasted version uh, of this. Um, so, I'm showing you this map in part because it's an extraordinary uh, artifact, a very interesting artifact. Um, but I also want to draw your attention to a, a detail on this map um, here in the circle. Um, and what you can see is that the map is uh, the strip that Mason and Dixon uh, describe uh, and, and the area around the actual line that they surveyed is, is very detailed. But the detail ends in the area that I've circled. Uh, meanwhile, the two parallel lines um, that circumscribe the scope of the map that, that, the, uh, uh, that, that the Englishman uh, created, uh, those lines continue. Um, and let me just show you a close-up of this detail. Um, and what you can see here are three uh, significant uh, um, uh, things. Um, the first is Dunkard Creek which I mentioned when I showed you the slide of me standing by the end point of the survey. Um, and then 230, mile marker 230. So this is roughly where the little monument that I was standing next to is situated. 
And then just to the east of these things, you see the phrase uh, war path. Um, and we get a sense of what's going on here when we look at the actual uh, documents, the, the manuscript uh, documents that Mason and Dixon prepared as they engaged in their surveying activities. They had a, an official journal which they submitted to their employers to demonstrate that they had fulfilled uh, the commission for which they were paid. Um, and in that journal, the entry for October 9th, 1767 says the following. It says, this day, the chief of the Indians informed us the above mentioned war path was the extent of the commission from the chiefs of the six nations and that he would not proceed one step further. So Mason Dixon and the nearly 40 other members of their surveying party uh, were traversing land controlled by the Iroquois Indians. And it was those Indians, not Mason and Dixon or their employers, who determined where the line would end. Um, and Mason and Dixon were well aware that that determination uh, was short of their planned end point, which is why in the map they depict this empty void, because they wanted to demonstrate to their uh, employers uh, that this was not their decision, that they understood that they had ended the survey short of its uh, planned uh, end point. Um, um, so, uh, this, the, these features here that I drew your attention to, they're all very closely related. The fact that the survey ended here um, had everything to do with the fact that it was just on the other side of this Iroquois uh, war path. Um, that was the point where the guides appointed by the Iroquois League to escort these surveyors through country controlled by uh, allies of the Iroquois said, that's it, you're done, time to turn tail. Um, <laughs> Now, it turns out that this war path uh, has significance far beyond what it says about the actual Mason-Dixon survey and the point at which uh, the, the survey uh, was, was uh, uh, brought to an end. Um, and, and so let me try to explain this uh, a bit. And it's, uh, it requires a little bit of historical background having to do with um, uh, uh, diplomatic, military, and commercial activities of um, the Iroquois League of, of Native Peoples, uh, located obviously, um, their primary territories are in uh, present day uh, New York State. Um, starting in the late 1670s, warriors from what at the time were the five nations of the Iroquois League uh, began traveling south. Um, th and I'm going to have to put my microphone on. I'm trying to see if the, unfortunately, the pointer. That doesn't work. But they started traveling south through the north branch of the Susquehanna River down to about here, which is present-day uh, Harrisburg, um, and then across to the Shenandoah Valley, down uh, through the Shenandoah River Valley to the uh, uh, Virginia and Carolina Piedmont. Um, and they uh, were utilizing this path uh, um, to, to provide support to their Iroquois-speaking uh, allies, uh, the Tuscarora people, who were engaged in um, uh, uh, rivalrous uh, and complex relations with their, um, uh, their neighbors, principally the Catawba peoples and, the, uh, and, and members of what would become the uh, Creek and, and Cherokee nations. Um, in the 1730s and 40s, so this has been going on by this point for about uh, uh, 60 or so years, um, the warpath acquired an added economic function. It had become a vector in an internal native slave trade that was carrying captives north to Iroquois country. And some of those captives, at least according to authorities in Virginia and Pennsylvania, were African descended slaves, uh, formerly owned by uh, planters and slave owners in Virginia. Um, this proved to be an extraordinarily provocative situation. There were already circumstances that had placed uh, the colony of Virginia at odds with uh, the Iroquois League. Um, and by the latter part of the 1730s, early 1740s, uh, it, there seemed to be the very dangerous prospect of an Iroquois-Virginia uh, war. Um, to try to uh, prevent this from happening, 
um, a, a treaty conference was convened in Lancaster in Pennsylvania in 1744. Um, and at that treaty conference, authorities, uh, diplomats from uh, Maryland, Virginia, and Pennsylvania uh, consulted with representatives of the Iroquois League. Um, and through a series of discussions and negotiations, um, and, and primarily because of concessions that Pennsylvania was willing to grant uh, the representatives of the Iroquois, the Iroquois agreed, uh, the representatives of the Iroquois at this meeting agreed to move their war path from the Susquehanna Valley to the western face of the uh, Appalachian Plateau. Um, and it's that war path that Mason and Dixon cross, and it's that war path that their, uh, their guides determine will be the end point of uh, the Mason-Dixon uh, line, at least as, as it was created by its, its original uh, namesakes. So again, my point here is that although the line of Charles Mason and Jeremiah Dixon was not in any way a boundary between slavery and freedom, it would be wrong to say that it had nothing to do with slavery. That labor system was simply far too entrenched and pervasive not to touch uh, even this relatively obscure uh, colonial surveying expedition. Now, it turns out, of course, that the early history of the line um, also has a great deal to do with more familiar uh, conceptions of slavery, more familiar patterns of slavery and freedom. And those familiar patterns reach far deeper into the line's history than the 19th century American sectional crisis. So as my book uh, recounts the history of slavery um, and its relation to the Mason-Dixon line, uh, the turning point in that history happens just 12 years after Mason and Dixon complete their survey, and just four years after the United States declares its independence from Great Britain. So on March 1st, 1780, the now state independent republic of Pennsylvania, its representative assembly uh, enacted the act for the gradual abolition of slavery, which was the world's first statutory uh, act to abolish slavery. So here we are, 12 years into the existence of, the, of a line that can actually be eponymously represented as the Mason-Dixon line. Um, um, that line becomes a demarcation between slavery and freedom, or I think it's more accurate to say it, it became a line between one state, Pennsylvania, with laws openly and explicitly designed to uh, uh, bring about the end of slavery, and two states, Maryland and Delaware, where this was not the case. Um, as a matter of legislative politics, Pennsylvania's Gradual Abolition Act was a remarkable achievement. Uh, potent voices in support of similar acts existed throughout the Mid-Atlantic uh, uh, in both Maryland and Delaware, but also in New Jersey and New York. And yet legislative initiatives in, in those four states all failed. And they only uh, succeeded in New York in 1799, so 19 years after Pennsylvania uh, enacts uh, its statute for, for abolition. And of course, in New Jersey, 1804, so uh, 24 years later. I think it's pretty clear that Pennsylvania is in the legal vanguard. Maryland would not abolish slavery until 1864, when it very, almost didn't, but barely ratified an anti-slavery constitution. Um, and technically, the state of Delaware never abolished slavery. Uh, only in 1901 did Delaware join the majority of states in ratifying the 13th Amendment to the United States Constitution, which banned slavery, and this was a purely partisan political uh, gesture by the Republican Party, who had finally gained control in, uh, in Delaware. Um, so to reiterate the point that I'm making, uh, Pennsylvania's 1780 gradual abolition statute transformed a boundary between British colonies, albeit one that had generated an enormous amount of, of conflict, into a boundary between states with profoundly divergent legal practices with respect to the institution of slavery. In this way, the law turned the original Mason and Dixon line into what would become the longest standing boundary uh, between uh, an anti-slavery state and slave states in the continental United States. And I believe it uh, remains the longest standing such boundary anywhere in the world. Um, it, it's, of course, important to point out that Pennsylvania's law 
uh, was hardly what a small but growing number of Pennsylvania abolitionists had hoped for. Um, in the words of the historians Gary Nash and Gene Soderland, the law freed not a single slave. And there were enslaved people in Pennsylvania at least until 1847 when the state uh, 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 unconditionally abolished slavery from within its borders. Um, the 1780 law sought to achieve the gradual end of slavery and in turn imposed the least cost on Pennsylvania's uh, slave owners and it sought to do this through a phased and painfully incremental approach uh, to, uh, to the slavery problem that involved focusing primarily on the children of enslaved mothers. So according to the law, uh, those children born after the act's passage in uh, 1780, um, they would be eligible for a form of manumission uh, at, at the age of 28. So they would be required to serve a 28 year term of indentured servitude um, until they would be uh, manumitted uh, provided that that uh, term, that the terms of, of servitude were fulfilled. Um, children born to mothers before the act's passage uh, would remain enslaved for life. Pennsylvania adjusted these uh, criteria uh, um, in subsequent decades. Um, but you can see uh, that there is no intent here uh, to achieve anything like immediate or, or far-reaching um, abolition of slavery. I do think, though, that, this, the, that the law created a legal framework um, for the gradual dissolution of slavery. And so insofar as the boundary line, insofar as the Mason-Dixon line became anything recognizably like a boundary between slavery um, and freedom, it has to be said that by design, it did so in a very incremental fashion. And I can illustrate this once again with a couple of maps here. Um, so what you see here, the first of these is uh, a map depicting um, uh, census data uh, that shows the percentage of enslaved people in the overall population of these border uh, uh, counties um, um, eight, in 1800, so 20 years after the passage of, of Pennsylvania's uh, statute. Um, and you can see that there remain enslaved people in all of the border counties of Pennsylvania except Somerset. And of course, even there, there's, there's grounds for, for, for qualification. Um, and this is a same map, but for 1840. Um, um, now you have more colonies, uh, sorry, more counties in Pennsylvania where there are no uh, identified uh, enslaved persons, but of course there are still uh, enslaved people in some of the counties adjoining the line. Um, the point here is uh, that the, the, the transformation of the line uh, into a boundary between um, uh, that we could sort of think of in terms that would be at all familiar to us as sort of a free state and, and slave states is, is very slow and, and incremental. But I think the slow changes in, uh, in the demography of slavery along the line um, uh, corresponded with some changes in the nature of the line that are enormously significant. So from an innocuous interstate boundary in 1780, uh, when the Pennsylvania statute was enacted. By the 1830s, the line had come to resemble an international border whose purpose was to regulate the movement of human beings. Um, and we can see abundant evidence of this in the testimony of refugees from slavery, the most famous of whom, of course, is Frederick Douglass, who flees uh, slavery in Baltimore um, in 1838, and who is annoyed uh, that, uh, that readers of his um, uh, his uh, personal memoirs uh, would be skeptical that his uh, decision and the process by which he uh, developed a plan to, to escape slavery uh, was so prolonged and deliberate, given the proximity, at least uh, in the view of someone who didn't really know what was going on, to uh, Pennsylvania and, and the prospect of freedom. Um, and Douglas points out that this is an outrageous a failure of imagination. He says uh, in one of his memoirs, he says, the nearer were the lines of a slave state to the borders of a free state, the greater was the trouble. 
Hired kidnappers infested the borders, and at every gate through which we had to pass, we saw a watchman. At every ferry, a guard. On every bridge, a sentinel. And in every wood, a patrol or slave hunters. We were hemmed in on every side. So as policing and surveillance along the line increased, so too did violence. For the first time since the colonial era, cross-border raids were beginning to erupt uh, into cross-border conflict. And I want to draw your attention to uh, a couple of notable cases. Um, the first of these occurs here, uh, where this blue circle is, just to the uh, west of the, uh, uh, the Embryville uh, location of the Stargazer Zone. Um, and this event occurred on September 11th, 1851 when the Maryland slave owner Edward Gorsuch and a group of slave catchers traveled to the small town denoted by the circle on the map, Christiana, Pennsylvania, um, to recover alleged fugitives from slavery. Gorsuch and his party converged on the home of William Parker, himself a refugee from slavery who had become a well-known Underground Railroad conductor. In the ensuing melee, Gorsuch was killed and another member of his party was seriously injured. Federal authorities referred to the incident at Christiana as a riot deserving of the American equivalent of the old English Riot Act uh, established in the early 18th century and entitling magistrates uh, to uh, arrest and disperse members of any threatening mob. 141 of the alleged rioters were arrested and 39 were charged with treason against the United States. Although the federal government's case fell apart, the crisis at Christiana, I think, marked a new chapter in the history of Mason and Dixon's line. And I'm going to just show you one image. So these are two veterans of the Christiana riot, Samuel Hopkins standing with the uh, corn cutter um, and Peter Woods seated. And uh, the, the photo is from 1896 and is believed to be uh, taken in front of the remains of the Parker family home in Christiana. So uh, this is, of course, not the best known instance of cross-border violence in this period. Uh, the best known such uh, violence uh, involved a transient businessman by the name of Isaac Smith. In the late summer of 1859, Smith and his associates uh, were in Chambersburg in Pennsylvania. Um, Uh, they were in uh, Chambersburg, uh, not far north of the line, assembling equipment for a mineral prospecting uh, expedition. Um, except, of course, Smith wasn't assembling pickaxes and blasting caps. He was collecting rifles, revolvers, and 950 iron pikes in preparation for a raid on the Federal Armory at Harper's Ferry. And Smith, of course, wasn't Smith. He was the abolitionist and freedom fighter John Brown. Brown's plan was to capture the Federal Armory so that he could arm Southern slaves for the largest slave rebellion since the Haitian Revolution. Uh, Brown was a great admirer of the leader of that uh, revolution, Toussaint Louverture. Um, and as we know, of course, Brown's raid uh, ended catastrophically for Brown and his small army of, of raiders. The upwelling of support from Virginia's slaves never materialized, and Federal Marines, under the command of Colonel Robert E. Lee, subdued what remained of Brown's anti-slavery army. After being summarily committed of treason by a Virginia court, Brown was executed on December 2nd, 1859. So I don't think it's a coincidence that as violence along the line increased, uh, so too did political division. And I, again, I'm gonna to revert to some maps to illustrate my point here. Um, so what you see in the first map is a map showing uh, county-level returns from the presidential election of 1848, pitting the Whig Zachary Taylor of Louisiana against Lewis Cass, the Democratic candidate uh, from Michigan. And I think what's significant about this map is that it doesn't show a whole lot of variation, at least in terms of uh, the line itself. There's not a whole lot of variation that correlates uh, with the dividing line between Pennsylvania and Maryland and, and Delaware. Um, but you can imagine what happens when we jump forward to uh, 1860, uh, the situation has completely changed. And now you can see that the majority of counties north of the line 
uh, supported the anti-slavery Republican Party candidate, Abraham Lincoln, while those south of the line overwhelmingly supported the Constitutional uh, Union Party candidate, John Bell of Tennessee, um, even though the Southern Democratic uh, candidate, John C. Breckinridge, um, uh, actually won uh, uh, Maryland, but Breckinridge didn't win most of the counties or the counties adjoining the, uh, the Mason-Dixon line. Um, my point in showing you these maps is, is to, to illustrate the, 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 uh, the kind of trajectory of sectionalism in the line's history, that this is really only a, a very late development in the line's history, that a, a, a political division uh, corresponding with the division in the legal treatment of enslaved persons uh, only happens very late in the, in the history of the Mason-Dixon line as, as I tell that history. So of course it would take a, a civil war and a 13th amendment to the Constitution uh, to finally destroy slavery along the line. Um, but Mason and Dixon's line, as we've seen, remained uh, etched in the national uh, memory. And I just want to show you one final slide um, that depicts three uh, well-known journalists. The, the picture here was uh, taken by Matthew Brady in 1871. Um, the best known of these journalists at the time this photo was taken is the man on the left, a man by the name of George Alfred Townsend, who went by the, uh, his byline, Gath, an abbreviation of his name. And of course, the middle person is Samuel Clemens, uh, soon to be known as Mark Twain. Um, and to Twain's left is a, uh, a Buffalo newspaper editor named David Gray. Um, Gath is, is an interesting person to me and, and features in my book. Um, um, so like his friend Clemens, uh, Gath turned from journalism to literature after he uh, uh, achieved fame in his uh, reporting on the Civil War. He was particularly noted for his uh, dispatches concerning the pursuit of John Wilkes Booth, Lincoln's assassin. Uh, John Wilkes Booth, of course, a product of the Maryland-Pennsylvania borderlands. He grew up on a, uh, his, uh, his father's property, which he himself tried to turn into a southern style, you know, deep southern style plantation is, in, um, is just north of Baltimore. Um, so this is how Gath uh, uh, came to be uh, so well known. It was, it was on the basis of his, his journalism. But like his friend Clemens, uh, following the war, Gath eventually turned to more lofty literary pursuits um, and began writing short stories and novels. Um, and like uh, his friend Clemens, uh, Gath's fiction was regional in its focus. For Clemens, uh, Twain, of course, the Mississippi and, and Missouri uh, area, um, but for uh, Gath, for Townsend, uh, the regional focus was the, um, uh, the borderlands of the original Mason-Dixon line. And that region, as Gath put it, uh, had been defined by a long boundary dispute, a dispute that left its original European settlers, as he put it, a predatory though God-fearing people prepared to fight with all their religious intensity for their right in the land and the dominion of their particular provinces. So again, this is being written in the 1880s, uh, um, late 1870s and 1880s. In Gath's fiction, the stoic people of the colonial Mason and Dixon borderlands are victims, victims of the greed of the jousting, uh, foppish English uh, uh, um, uh, proprietors, the Pens and the Calverts. Now, I don't think it's surprising that Few have heard of George Alfred Townsend. I, I suspect few of you in the room have actually heard of him or have read any of his fiction. Um, that was also true uh, in the 19th century. Townsend was not nearly and did not achieve nearly the celebrity for his literary pursuits uh, that his friend um, uh, Twain did. Um, and I think part of the reason for this is that uh, late 19th century Americans had very little interest in the history of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, and this was largely because late 19th century Americans, at least white Americans, were embarked on a great project of forgetting, forgetting about the great dividing line that had split the country apart uh, a half a century earlier. So again, thank you so much for coming. And I will welcome any questions.
Thank you. Okay. Thanks for being here. Um, we, thanks for the great explanation of the implications of the fallout uh, 60 to 80 years after the line was done. What kind of political, social, economic fallout was there at the time uh, once the dispute was settled as far as Marylanders, Marylanders woke up and all of a sudden they're Pennsylvanians? They have to go to the DMV, get a new driver's license, that kind of thing. Thank you. Uh, it's, it's an outstanding question, um, and it's a problem. Uh, so the big uh, resolution that's achieved by the survey has to do with taxes. Um, and one of, the, one of the problems that this boundary dispute and others throughout the colonies generated was the habituated experience of non-taxation. So uh, colonial the, 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 the authorities who controlled colonies, sometimes it was private families, as in the case of the ones that we've talked about today. Sometimes it was uh, agents of the English crown, the British crown in the 18th century. Um, sometimes it was a kind of weird assemblage of remnants from the 17th century, like you had in uh, Massachusetts. Um, they, you know, these are much like government today, uh, agencies that have revenue generating uh, interests um, and it's very difficult to do that when you don't know who is living in which uh, jurisdiction. Um, so I think the main achievement that, that this has in terms of you know kind of on the ground politics and policy, um, at least the intent, doesn't actually work out this way because of the revolution, um, but the intent is that now we can levy taxes, and we can levy it, the right government can levy the right taxes on the right people. And it was an urgent matter when the line was, uh, was, uh, was established, when Mason Dixon were hired, uh, because the colonies had just been through an incredibly costly war, particularly costly for uh, the colony of Pennsylvania, uh, whose internal politics were shredded and torn apart by fiscal disputes uh, centering on the just distribution of the burden, the, the expense burden engendered by the prior uh, war, the French and Indian War, as, uh, as we call it here in the US. Um, um, in terms of uh, immediate political fallout, there is quite a bit of it, particularly in the far western part of the line, um, the part that Mason Dixon don't survey. Um, and this gets tangled up with British government policy. So the British government, following that Seven Years' War, the French and Indian War, um, attempted to uh, um, uh, partition its North American possessions, which had now tripled in size, or perhaps even more than that, as a result of the settlement, the peace, following that war, by uh, uh, introducing a dividing line of its own through the, 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 the spine of the Appalachian Plateau, known as the Proclamation Line of 1763. And it turns out that this line crossed the line that Mason Dixon uh, surveyed. And this raised the question of, well, whose territory were they actually surveying? Um, and what do we do with the part that they didn't survey? Um, and who is, lives in this area um, it's, a, it's an enormously fascinating uh, story, but you know, it generates uh, intense jurisdictional confusion and conflict, which has direct relevance to subsequent crises uh, that lead to the, uh, to the American Revolution. Um, yeah, but that's a very uh, excellent, thank you, yep. I just want to build on uh, something you said about the uh, division between the lines. Around 1991, I mean, I'd, I'd taken Civil War courses in college and was always fascinated by it, but 1991, my dad and I went from Stafford, Virginia, down to Appomattox Courthouse. And uh, 
surveyed the sites and took it all in and looked, walked through McLean House and how well it was preserved. And uh, on the way out, I saw a picture of McLean House in 1929, and it was in complete ruins. And I asked the park ranger, I said, how in Lord's name could something as important as McLean House be left to go to ruins? And he said to me, do you realize where you're at right now? <laughs> he said, do you think these people wanted to remember what happened at that location? So that's where I really got my first real appreciation for how, how long the effects of the war was. Thanks. Yeah, that memory uh, has a lot to do with, with war, for sure. Yep. Thank you. Good comment. Over here. So um, I pose with a lot of boundary, mo mo boundary monuments and things like that as well. So I was glad to see your family <laughs> trip. Um, I am familiar with George Alfred Townsend. <clears throat> in fact, on the border of Frederick and Carroll County is Gatlin State Park in Maryland, and including a house and a war memorial that, that is on site. In your travels, did you happen to visit since part of your book? I know about location? it, but I haven't been. But it's on my list, yeah. I do know about it, and uh, yeah, he, he, he wrote a novel about the area, Katie of Catoctin, uh, it pertains to that. But yes, this was his, his Ardennes forest. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Yep. Thank you. Yeah. But how is it? Like, I've, I've learned a lot, of, but I'm thinking my. I don't feel like a lot of time is spent subject. Thank you. Um, well, huh? Oh, I'm sorry. The question: uh, How did I get interested in this? Um, um, and there's, there's, uh, there. It's, that's a hard question to answer, actually. Um, in part because the the answer is really boring. Um, that basically, I wrote this book about this revolutionary radical Thomas Paine, who got interested in iron bridges seemed very incongruous, and I wanted to understand what that was all about. And what I discovered was that this was a political thing for him, that he saw bridges as a way to unify uh, what he saw as a vociferous, dissolving United States. He thought the country was falling apart just a few years after it achieved its independence. And he thought this was a way to kind of help bring people together to get readily uh, uh, and serviceable uh, means of crossing rivers. Um, um, and his main focus for this project was Pennsylvania, um, that he thought Pennsylvania was about to fall apart, basically. Um, and as I worked on that, uh, I th thought a lot about slavery, that this is really the crucial uh, institution, the crucial system of laws uh, that, that drives the country apart. Um, and it starts doing it very early in its, in its history. We know this. Um, it, it's a problem as soon as there is discussion of union, even before we get to 1787 when there's debates in the Constitutional Convention and the like. Um, and so I started to think, gee, I mean, what, Paine doesn't really, Paine is an anti-slavery, he's opposed to slavery, but he doesn't really think about the significance of slavery as a, uh, 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 as, a, as, a, as a source of political and, and other division. Um, and it, this is again why I say it's, I don't know if it's boring or it reflects poorly on me, but it dawned on me at some point, I don't really know to tell you the truth, when I realized that, you know, the area that he was concerned about, and he lived, he, in fact, it's, it, it's thought that he may have drafted the original uh, statute for abolishing slavery in, in Pennsylvania. Um, but the area that most concerned him in terms of, of sectional division within the state uh, is, adjoins the Mason-Dixon line. And, you know, so at some point I thought, well, this is really nuts. Like, he's worried about that. But Pennsylvania has passed this really radical law, at least, again, radical only in the terms, uh, only in contemporary terms, um, and, you know, he doesn't, he's not interested in that, it doesn't occur to him that that's uh, 
potential source of, of a different kind of sectionalism. Um, and, you know, as I thought about that, uh, I thought about the fact that, or it occurred to me, and again, like, I, I can't tell you exactly how the thought pattern went here. Um, um, I'm a big Thomas Pynchon fan, so I had read his novel, Mason Dixon, uh, years and years ago when it first came out in 1997. So I knew about Mason and Dixon, I knew about the line, but at some point when I was sort of, you know, in the kind of morass of thinking about, you know, pain and the like, it, you know, I, it, it occurred to me that the, that the line that separated Pennsylvania that is established by this statute is the line that they surveyed. And so then I started to think, well, that's actually interesting. Like, why hasn't anyone made that connection or tried to sort of explain whether there is a history there that links what happened before with these Englishmen and their land disputes and, and all that stuff to what happens after once the United States begins to rip itself apart over the issue of slavery. And, you know, I kind of thought this is a kind of weird thing. Like, it's obvious this is an important, you know, like, how is it that there's never been a book written about this, you know? Um, I think maybe, and I, I would have to admit, it's, it's, a, it's a once in a career kind of experience for a historian to, to, to kind of encounter something that seems so obvious and so central that has just, for various reasons, escaped, you know, people's attention. I, I don't know. I think, to be honest with you, I think a lot of it has to do with the region. It, it's, it, people don't, historians, Patrick is an exception to this, but, but the, you know, the, this, this is sort of between and betwixt. It's, it's not the mid-Atlantic, it's not the Chesapeake. What do you call this borderlands region? Nobody, it didn't fit in any, cosm any kind of the, 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 the sort of, you know, historians' geographies. Um, and I think that might be why it, it was neglected. And of course, people like Townsend, who in the 19th century thought they had a story to tell about this, you know, for reasons that I, that I suggest, uh, it wasn't, <laughs> wasn't to be, or at least his particular version of it wasn't one that, that drew much attention. Um, but that's, yeah, I appreciate that question. I think, you know, uh, historians are, you know, we, we don't just, uh, we're not just reporters. Like, we have to think creatively about the stories that we try to tell, and, and process is really central to that. So I, I appreciate the question. Thank you. Um, I grew up in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania, as a member of the Society of Friends. And I was just wondering if, when you looked into this, if the religious beliefs of the Quakers and the Mennonites and the Amish have anything to do with why north of the line there seems to be more resistance to slavery than there was, than there seemed to be south of the line. Uh, so, as you know, there are Quakers all over that region, south and north of the line. So there's lots of Quakers in uh, Delaware. There are Mennonites in that part of the country, uh, also in Maryland, of course. Uh, there were more, you know, in, in the 18th century. Um, um, so I don't know that the, the I think the, the reason that Pennsylvania is exceptional uh, it does have to do with the presence of Quakers and the Philadelphia meeting is, is incredibly powerful and influential. Um, but I don't think that, that, that it alone could have achieved what the legislature achieved, what the assembly achieved in 1780. I think a lot of this has to do with the, the kind of rump revolutionary politics um, that the, the assembly at the time is not representative of the entity that becomes the state of Pennsylvania. It's incredibly biased uh, in terms of, of, of you know, the, it's, the people that are represented in it uh, are Eastern focused. Um, um, I think also it's, it's, it's a type of entity at that time, a unicameral uh, single, there's no, you know, uh, governor, there's no check on the assembly, such that if you get a majority, um, in favor of something, 
uh, it, it becomes law. And I think that has a lot to do with, with what ends up happening. Um, if you look at the actual voting and how it breaks down in terms of who voted to abolish slavery in Pennsylvania, um, uh, you know, the margins are not huge. It, it didn't pass with, you know, it wasn't as if it was in any way unanimous. Um, and, and, and it's very hard to sort of parse what we know about how that all shook down. You know, just, of course, people don't necessarily vote uh, as politicians for something because they believe in it. So I, I think it's really tough to, to kind of say, well, this is, you know, because Pennsylvania is Quaker. Um, I mean, I, I think that's a factor, uh, for sure. But I don't think it's it's it, you know I think it's it's a complicated story. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, there's someone in the back. Thank you for um, a really interesting talk. Um, I have another question about kind of the origins of the Mason-Dixon line. Um, and I'm curious to know if there's something about that border dispute between Pennsylvania and Maryland that calls for such a like meticulous drawing of a boundary. Because Pennsylvania has several other boundary disputes kind of in this same period in the mid 18th century with Virginia, with Connecticut. What is it about Pennsylvania versus Maryland that like prompts the drawing of this line specifically? Um. So it, it's, there are a couple of answers to that question. One is that, that they were, there was a, a, a court decision, Chancery Court, King's Court, uh, um, um, uh, issued an opinion or a decision that required that this dispute be settled and that there be a boundary. Um, and so uh, that's one factor, that, that prior to this point, the, uh, the, uh, the the board of the uh, the board of trade, which was the sort of body that oversaw, had opined about what should happen and said, "Look, this is bad. You guys need to figure this out." Um, but for the most part, the way this was dealt in all the colonies, the way this was dealt with was through local internal commissions. Each co colony would have its own commission. They would converge and then try to deal with the with the surveying uh, work. Um, so I think one, that is one reason it, it was just, there was an imperative politically to get it dealt with. Uh, the cost issue is another one, that they needed some way to solve this where there would be no subsequent dispute because Pennsylvania, the, the Penn family were in terrible, they were struggling. The, 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 so the tax uh, structure of the colony was changing. There was a lot of pressure uh, for the Penns to pay uh, taxes on Penn-owned land. Um, um, and, uh, and, you know, they, they, they couldn't, they had to find, they had to solve their just jurisdiction problems to solve their revenue problems. Um, and then I think the scope of it. So, you know, it's one thing when the boundary is in a swamp, which is true in the Southern Virginia boundary, which is a, was a highly disputed thing. Um, but it's another thing when it runs through, you know, territories that are heavily, relatively, heavily uh, settled by European settler, you know, uh, settlers. Um, and I think, you know, there's, there's not, there's nowhere else in the colonies at this time uh, where you have so many small farms reaching so far into the, the west uh, of the continent. Um, this is a, you know, the first breadbasket to the world is this area. Um, and I think, you know, uh, the, the, this is one reason why sub prior attempts at dealing with this fell to grief, that, that, that to do it internally in the colonies using colonial surveyors and commissions, you know, within the colonies, it, it just didn't work. There was too much at stake. Um, um, and I think, you know, the, the, the Pens and the, and, and the Penn brothers and, and Frederick uh, uh, Calvert was, uh, he was into science, interested in science. And he thought, yeah, this is the way to do this, that we need astronomers who can use astronomical techniques to, to do this. It's too big, it's too complicated, um, um, too sensitive. Uh, the tangent line separating uh, uh, Delaware from 
uh, from Maryland alone had nobody could do it. The col there was no one in the colonies who had been able to do that. And so I think that's, that's a, yet another factor um, in why they finally had to, to employ these, uh, these astronomers. Yep. Thanks. Yep. Great. Thank you. And that was one of our resident fellows, Sarah Donovan, who's been spending three months here at Mount Vernon. So thank you for that question, Sarah. But most of all, thank you, Ed, for that stimulating talk. The book is available for sale, and he'll be signing it outside. Thank you, Ed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.